The Most Beautiful Roof in the World, pages 28 through 31. Please open up your book and follow along. Meg and her sons will wait until late afternoon to go up, for this is often when there is a flurry of activity in the canopy as the macaws and toucans fly home to their roosts after foraging and the spider monkeys show off with aerial leaps as the day cools. So first the boys show Meg the jade green pool in the shadows of a limestone cave carved out by the creek. They swim in, in and out of its shadows, resting on mossy rocks. Just outside the cave, over the surface of the water, epiphytes drop their aerial roots from 100 feet overhead. The banks of the creek here grow thick with moss and strange ferns, and the immense butchers' tree roots are covered with thin veils of bright orange lichen. After swimming, James stands in a slender arrow of sunlight, and an owl butterfly lands on his head. He holds very still for almost a minute. He wonders if the butterfly thinks his bright blonde hair is a weird flower. The boys help their mom ferry equipment in the old leaky canoe to the other side of the creek, where she will set up the gear for a column study. Biological diversity means the various and different living things that are found within a community. Although Meg's work is focused on the canopy and the creatures and processes of life that occur within it, she must be able to make a comparison with something else in order to have a true picture of how this part of the machine works. Therefore, on the other side of the river, she has marked off several five-meter squares on the forest floor that are situated directly under some of the key observation platforms on the walkway. In Meg's mind, this square is like a column that stretches straight up to the canopy. It is her aim to try to inventory or count the different species of plants and insects starting from the ground up. There have been methods devised for doing this. The boys begin by helping another one of Meg's graduate student assistants dig pitfall traps within the square. With spoons and small garden trowels, they dig holes seven or eight inches straight deep. Into each hole, they sink a plastic cup with one inch of alcohol in the bottom of it. By morning, they should have a fair sampling of insects that creep across this portion of the forest floor and drop into the cup. With another graduate student, Meg counts the trees. She begins at the top of the column with the biggest trees. There are two tall trees, the tops of which reach the canopy. Inside the region known as the understory, which reaches approximately 30 feet in height, there are four different species of trees a grius, a palm, an acacia, and one she does not know the name of, but will look up when she returns to Selby Gardens. These understory trees might someday emerge into the canopy, or they might be crowded out by the young saplings of the next layer down. There are 41 saplings, four or five feet in height, struggling toward the filtered light. Among these 41 are five different species. Then, just inches above the ground, Meg and her assistant count 197 seedlings. They, too, have begun their struggle toward the light at the top of the canopy. Continuing to count, Meg finds 10 ferns of three different species and 41 lycopods, or mosses, of which there are five different species. There are also three different kinds of lichen, and on the grius, there are 37 epiphytes. By the time Meg and her assistant finish the inventory, they will have counted some 350 plants and 200 different plant species within this 5 meter square. In a temperate forest, such an area might hold a total of 51, 50 plants and at the most 30 different species. Next, Meg needs to sample the kind of insect life that lives just above the ground in the shrubbery. To do this, she gets out a beading tray a shallow screen tray that measures one square meter. While the boys and her graduate assistant hold the tray, she shakes what she estimates to be a cubic meter of foliage for 10 seconds. They all count together. At the end of 10 seconds, they set down the tray and see what fell from the shrubbery. One leaf hopper, Meg says, pointing to an insect frantically hopping about on the screen. Here's one with really weird jaws, James says, as he squints closely at the tray. In this first shake of the foliage, there are also ants, cockroaches, springtails, spiders, and a caterpillar. 
they do this two more times with different foliage all at the same level within the five meter square next the boys help their mother do a set of sweeps sweeping is another technique for sampling insects in the column the sweeps however unlike the pitfall trays or the beating tray are aimed more at flying insects using a butterfly net Meg aims at a cubic meter of air three or four feet up from the ground. She sweeps the net to the right, then to the left. She does this four times, then sets the net down to count her catch. There is one leaf hopper, three diptera or flies, and three beetles. The sweeps, the beating trays, the pitfall traps, and the counting of seedlings, saplings, and trees are all ways for Meg to take snapshots of diverse rainforest life finally when it seems everything in the five meter square has been accounted for it is time for the boys to go to the top of the column to the canopy they climb expertly into their harnesses with their mom in the lead and their uncle ed behind they begin their ascent the boys are not in the least nervous though meg is she has left behind all of her note-taking equipment so she can concentrate on the boys safety they know not to fool around argue or whine they must think and climb and pay attention james and edward are very excited for now at last they are going to the place where their mother has gone five days a month every month of the year for as long as they can remember it is a special world they think of this high secret place as their mother's world but they know it is only where she works it is the canopy and it belongs to rainforests all over the world on the planet earth but still, they like to think of it as their mother, their mom's own special place. And finally, finally, they have grown big enough to be let in.